How's everybody doing? I want to start with a little bit of audience participation, but there's a risk to doing this, because right now it's nap hour, right? It's the afternoon, everyone's getting a little sleepy, probably had some of the snacks from downstairs, kind of greasy, feeling heavy, okay? But I want to ask a question, and that question is, why do you homeschool? Now, again, this is risky, but close your eyes, seriously. Think back to that moment when you decided to homeschool your children. What made you do it? What were the feelings that you had about why you chose to make that decision? Were you excited? Were you nervous? Were you hopeful? Now, I'm gonna venture to guess, you can open your eyes, that you did not feel like this. <laughs> this is a seven-year-old girl whose father was a photographer professionally, and he was setting up his camera in the living room to do some low-light experiments, just clicking away, not paying attention to his daughter who was just sitting there doing her homework. And he was later processing the photos. He published this online and said, this is the first photo of my daughter that I ever hated. This isn't why we educate kids to produce feelings like this, either for them or for you as parents, right? This isn't why we do that. Now, I have a story to share as we begin. I'm gonna pull up these remarks right here that happened about a decade ago in the state of New York. Now, this is a photo of Erica Goldson. She was the high school valedictorian for her class. She had the opportunity, like most valedictorians, to be up on stage in front of all of her peers. And who's sitting behind her? It's, you know, the principal, it's the teachers, it's the administrators, all the adults who invest all their time and energy into producing students like her, valedictorian. So Erica stands up on stage behind a podium. We'll simulate it here. She says, I cannot say that I am any more intelligent than my peers. I can attest that I'm only the best at doing what I'm told and working the system. <laughs> so now imagine you're the administrator sitting behind her and they're like, where's that hook to pull her off a stage, like <laughs> exit left, right? But she continued, they, they let her continue. She said, yet here I stand and I'm supposed to be proud that I've completed this period of indoctrination. I will leave in the fall to go on to the next phase expected of me in order to receive a paper document that certifies that I am capable of work. But I contest that I am a human being, a thinker, an adventurer, not a worker. A worker is someone who is trapped within repetition, a slave of the system set up before him. But now I have successfully shown that I was the best slave. I did what I was told in the extreme. And this is like the grade A product of schools, right? This is the valedictorian, the person who we all look to. Wow, you're so great, right? And she's sharing these things openly. She says, while others sat in class and doodled to later become great artists, I sat in class to take notes and become a great test taker. While others would come to class without their homework done because they were reading about an interest of theirs, I never missed an assignment. While others were creating music and writing lyrics, I decided to do extra credit even though I never needed it. So I wonder, why did I even want this position? Sure, I earned it, but what will come of it? When I leave educational institutionalism, will I be successful or forever lost? I have no clue about what I want to do with my life. I have no interests because I saw every subject of study as work. And I excelled at every subject just for the purpose of excelling, not learning, and quite frankly, now I'm scared. Wow. wow, right? Now, if she can write that well and speak that well, I'm sure she'll <laughs> be, be fine, right? She's got some talents that maybe she doesn't recognize. But as we think about educating our kids, how we get them to learn, how we inspire them to learn, right? We don't want it to be like that little girl who saw everything as drudgery and she's crying because she can't figure it out and she's terrified by her math. We don't want them to be like Erica Goldson where they work a system for the sake of working a system, going through the motions. We want something more. And yet, for so many teachers, it ends up becoming part of a system where, as H.L. Mencken once said, he said, the aim of the modern education system is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed and train a standardized citizenry, and to put down dissent and originality. The creativity, the insights, the personal interests of all these kids are subordinated in the modern education system to the system, to the conveyor belt process. 
And I have a confession to make. Maybe some of you will leave the room and throw tomatoes at me or something, but I don't like the term homeschooling. I use it, it's shorthand, makes it, you know, we know what we're talking about. But I don't like the word, we need a better word because homeschooling implies schooling in the home. And I have seen too many homeschoolers who try to recreate within the four walls of their own home many of the failures that we'll talk about in a moment of the modern education system. And then they get flummoxed like, why isn't this working? And why is everything drudgery? And my kids hate this. And it's because we are all most like, how many here in the, in the room went to the public fool system when they were young kids? And yes, I said public fool. And said, so most of us are graduates of this system. And then we're like, hey, I'm breaking free. I'm homeschooling my kids. But we have so much of the bias and the programming and the, the background that we bring to this. And we end up schooling in the home and that creates some problems that we'll talk about. Now, I am not the only one to talk about these problems. There was a group that recently got together called the National Commission on Excellence in Education. They spent 18 months going around the country, trying to understand how America's schools were doing. They talked to educators, they talked to parents, they talked to students, reviewed test scores, reviewed curriculum, kind of a, 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 you know, open meetings all across the country. Listening tour, you might say. 18 months concluded, they wrote a report called A Nation at Risk, in which they said that America's educational foundations are being threatened by a rising tide of mediocrity and that if a foreign government had attempted to impose on America the very mediocre educational standards we now have today, we might have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, they said, we've allowed this to happen to ourselves. Now, perhaps another confession, I'm good at these because I'm a very imperfect person. Uh, I lied to you. This was not a recent group. This was in 1983. 40 years ago, in fact, the anniversary is in two weeks. I actually have a book coming out on that topic, which you can pre-order on Amazon, called Mediocrity. <laughs> 40 Ways Government Schools Are Failing Our Kids. As a wake-up call for any of the parents that you know in your life who still think that everything's fine, I went to public school and I turned out fine and everything's okay, right? That there are many problems in our modern education system, and as we're going to get into, as we homeschoolers, we're like, oh, we're so much better, we're no longer part of that, and yet many of us fall into the same trap. So to talk through that, I want to begin by asking what's wrong. Before we get into solutions, we have to get alignment on the problems. Anyone in the room heard of John Taylor Gatto before? Okay, last conference I was at, I got like two hands. I was blown away. This guy is like the granddaddy of homeschooling, and yet so many homeschoolers don't know. John Taylor Gatto was a 30-year public school teacher in New York. He was trying to reform the system from within. He was one of those great teachers that you read about or hear about or maybe hopefully experienced at one point in your life. He was bucking the trend trying to break the system, ignoring the rules, doing whatever he wanted to best inspire and help the kids in his class. He won New York City Teacher of the Year. This was in the 80s. The following year, he won New York State Teacher of the Year. Keep in mind, these are awards given out like by the establishment, the you know, teachers unions and PTA and so forth. They're lavishing him with praise for really trying to innovate within the system. And yet in the very same year that he won New York State Teacher of the Year, he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, the title of which said, I quit, I think. He went on to talk about how he was hurting kids more than he was helping them because he was operating in a system full of problems and as much as he tried, he couldn't overcome them. And so he quit and started writing books. This is the reason why I started homeschooling. Uh, uh, well, let me, let me correct that. I read this book and then I handed it to my then fiance. <laughs> and she read the book and said, yeah, we're gonna homeschool. And so. As she likes to tease me, you know, I take 98% of the credit, do 2% of the work. So, uh, dumbing us down is John's attempt, he passed away a couple years ago, uh, it's his attempt to explain the problems in the modern education system, not just in public schools, but in so many of our home schools as well. So let's walk through those. Finish this sentence, mitochondria is? All right, my man up here up front, and half of you, right? We all know this. This is where we see the breakdown of the modern education system. There, there's two models, okay? There's the just-in-case model. This is, in 40 years, you may need to know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, so we're gonna make you memorize that right now, just in case, you know, when you're a grandpa and, I don't know, your grandkid asks you what's the powerhouse of the cell, you can answer the question, because they themselves are having to memorize the same thing. The modern education system, their model is just-in-case learning. Just in case you ever need this in the future, we're gonna cram your head full of all these things that you have to regurgitate, we're gonna test you, we're gonna make you go through this curriculum soup to nuts and you're gonna learn everything. Uh, when we started homeschooling, we used the, uh, 
what are they called? Like what every sixth grader needs to know. Whatever, you heard of these books, right? And at the beginning, we're like, oh, every sixth grader needs to know this because some book says it. And so we're like cramming their heads full of stuff, right? Because we as parents, you know it, we get FOMO on behalf of our kids. Fo you know, for those who don't know, fear of missing out, right? It's like, oh, my kids are gonna fail in life if I don't like cram this stuff in their head right now. And we fall into that same trap. But that's not how you and I as adults operate. We don't operate under a just-in-case learning model. We operate under a just-in-time learning model. So your refrigerator breaks down. It's like, oh, thank goodness I read the manual 24 years ago, and now I know how to fix the refrigerator, right? No, it's just in time for when you need the information. You go read the manual. You pull up a YouTube video, right? Like, you figure it out. We cobble together information from all over the place because we have context. So. The problem is that we're forcing kids to memorize and learn all this content without context. Does that make sense? They have no clue why they're supposed to learn it. They raise their hand, they're like, why, why do we have to, oh, it's gonna be on the test, put your hand down, right? Or it's in the curriculum, we have to get you through it. And there's no context. As we'll talk about a little bit later, context changes everything. And the best context that your kids can have are their own personal interests. Okay, so the first problem that we're gonna talk about is the conveyor belt system. We're all familiar with this, I'm sure, right? The idea that like everyone needs to learn the same thing in the same way at the same age and then you proceed to the next thing and that's how our modern education system is built. It's how a lot of our homeschool curriculum is built as well. This idea that you start at one point and everyone moves along the same linear path. Another problem is that everything is highly regimented and structured, right? This is best seen in, in schools but we do it in a lot of our homeschools too. It's like okay, 45 minutes, I'm gonna learn biology, and then a bell's gonna ring, and then I have to go over here, and I'm gonna learn English, and then I'm gonna, okay, bell's gonna ring, I'm gonna go learn American history. And we deprive kids of deep learning. You've probably binged reading like Wikipedia articles at three in the morning about some obscure historical thing that just spark your interest, right? That deep learning is where information really sticks, but you have to give yourself time. And when we're machine gun, you know, firing all this information at kids, we're depriving them of opportunity to focus and go deep. And sometimes the regimented structure that we impose upon kids during the learning process can be an impediment. Related to that, another problem is that education has become very industrialized. We're gonna talk a little bit, uh, in a little bit about the contrast to this, but this model where, like the conveyor belt, it's like, here's this system, and this has been designed, and you need to learn this before learning this, and then you're gonna go there, and then you're gonna do what you're told. I don't know if you know this, but when modern public schools were first created, they had a different name. Anyone know what that is? Factory schools. They were literally built to produce good factory workers because the economy of the day was people getting a good job to just sit there and move one widget from here to here and then do that 80,000 times. And they needed people who were rule followers, who could do what they were told, who could do simple tasks, follow orders, sit still, and all the rest. They were literally called factory schools. And yet we have the same schooling model in our country today, yet an entirely different economy. So, another problem with education is that it's authoritarian. I can't tell you over the, gosh, 10, 11 years that I've been talking to homeschool groups and homeschooling ourselves, the burnout that I've seen, mostly from the moms, because again, 98% of the work, 2% of the credit, right? The burnout that comes from moms who feel like to homeschool successfully, they need to be the knower of all the things. Oh, I, I was never good at biology. How am I gonna make sure that my kid learns science well, right? And, and the inadequacies that we often feel as parents in our own weaknesses and where we were deficient in school, we feel like we have to be able to teach that to our kids because we're so used to an authoritarian model. I am going to teach you this. You are gonna learn this from me. I will dispense this knowledge to you. Whether it's a teacher or a parent, it's a problem and we'll talk about the solution. The final problem, and this is one that I didn't really understand until I read John Taylor Gatto, and I'm reading his book, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, that totally resonated with one of the reasons why I didn't like schooling. And that was age segmentation. If any of you have a bunch of kids, or you take them to summer camp, and they're at church, or whatever, they're around other kids, you see that the older kids, when they have mentorship opportunities to interact with the younger kids, it really kind of moderates some of their teen excesses and rebellious behavior and so forth. And the young kids are always looking up to and idolizing the older kids. Um, there's a book I'll, I'll mention in a moment that's fascinating that talks about through human society how when you have, a, uh, historically, when you have age mixing, you have all of these opportunities for kids to benefit one another. And yet, so much of our schooling is like, oh, you were, you know, birthed from your mother within the same 12-month period as all these kids? Great, we're going to shove you all into a classroom. Like, that's the commonality with which we 
associate kids together, it makes no sense. And again, we'll talk about the solution. But before that, I want to talk about Paloma and Sergio. So Paloma, she grew up in a border town in Mexico in poverty. Her father would just rummage through trash all day trying to you know, find something that would allow them to get food for the day. She was a very poor student uh, in a poor school falling behind in everything. The school hardly had electricity most days, certainly no internet access, uh, was deprived of a lot of resources. Sergio was her teacher. New class, new year, they come in and all the desks are pushed to the side in a big circle. And the kids are taking their seats and everything and Sergio just sits back and, and he says, okay, welcome to class. I wanna begin with a question. What do you guys wanna learn? And that simple question transformed Paloma's life, the life of her class, the life of her school, the life of her school district. Paloma became the most proficient math student in the entire country. She won top awards and scholarships. She lifted her entire class who followed her and who were inspired by the same question. And Sergio's attempt to simply be open to the interests and curiosities of his students allowed him to adapt and teach the material in a way that resonated with them. After Paloma took off and started, you know, acing all these tests and, and winning all these uh, competitions, Sergio asked her one day, what changed for you? How, how did this happen? You, were, you hated math, you were at the bottom, like you didn't like it at all. And she said, no one had ever asked me how I wanted to learn it before. So how did Sergio know to do that? How would, how would a teacher like that be so unconventional as to ditch the curriculum, ditch the standards, and speak to the students directly? Well, in part, Sergio was inspired by Sugata Mitra, who is famous for what's called the hole in the wall experiment. You can Google it. And Sugata had this uh, kind of like computer company right here in this building. And what you literally see is a hole in the wall where he shoved a computer into it. There's a slum on the other side full of kids just playing soccer and so forth all day. And he put a computer out there and it had internet access, no manuals, no adults, just a computer with internet access. And yet these kids, after mere days, started teaching themselves advanced topics. They were learning about things like DNA replication and learning other languages and exposing themselves to information surely because they had curiosity, they had resources, and they had freedom. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Sugata Mitra, they've, they've replicated this over and over again, this hole in the wall experiment, that when you simply give kids the resources and the freedom and honor their curiosity, their learning and comprehension and retention skyrocket. So that's where Sergio learned it, which leads us to talking about some of the solutions. So if the problem is that we operate on a conveyor belt, the kids are being taught what to think, that we're telling them every step of the way, right, that you have to learn this in this order and go there, the obvious solution is its counterpart. We need to be teaching our kids instead how to think. We need to shun the conveyor belt. I can't tell you how many homeschool parents I've talked to, oh yeah, we got off the conveyor belt by pulling our kids out of school and then they have their own like mini subtle conveyor belt at home that they you know, can't really detect. And, and we fall into the trap of answering our kids' questions. And I get it, we are asked why by our kids like 8,000 times a day and it becomes easy to just give them the answer or say because I said so and move on. Yet what we have to do, the ideal is that we're challenging our children to answer the questions for ourselves. We are not the encyclopedia. We are a resource provider. We're pointing our kids and challenging them Socratically to try and understand and try and learn on their own where they can access the information and find what they need. If the next problem is that things are highly regimented and structured, the obvious counterpart to that is education freedom. Getting rid of the structure, getting rid of the conveyor belt, using curriculum as a crutch and as a guide, but not as a constraint where you have to adapt to it. Right? Curriculum and materials and books and field trips and the internet and YouTube and all the rest should be adapted to our children. I believe, right, as a father, that God has given me some pretty unique individuals as children who are definitely not the same as one another. I can share all kinds of stories about that. And, uh, and that they are different. And so I parent them differently and we discipline them differently. I teach them differently too. They have different interests, they have different curiosities. And I need to give them the freedom to be able to explore what they're curious about rather than saying, you will conform to this curriculum standard that some faceless committee 18 years ago decided that every seventh grader needs to learn, right? Education freedom. So this is what homeschool often looks like in our family. Mom is a jungle gym and so the two kids there, she's trying to read a book to them. There's a dog over there somewhere that's like super black and I guess you can't even see because she's camouflaged in. 
right? But this, this in my mind is education and freedom. It's the, I can't tell you how much learning I've seen with my kids in the informal moments. You've seen this? When, when you sit down, okay, kids, we're going to study this, right? And they're like, ah, oh, you know. But then, like, you're in the car, and they hear something on the radio, and they ask a question, and that creates an amazing conversation that they retain that information much longer, right, than at any other time. If you don't know, probably a lot of you know the Tuttle Twins books. We have a Tuttle Twins podcast, and when we were figuring out how to do that, we decided to do 15-minute episodes that are designed for mom or dad and the kids in the car when they're running to errands or driving wherever, just to spark those conversations, because it's in those informal instances that so much learning happens. And education freedom is what that's all about, creating those little sparks and those opportunities for informal learning. If you want to swing the pendulum far to the extreme to understand how this works, we can talk about Sudbury School. Anyone heard of Sudbury? I'm always blown away that so few people have heard of this. Okay, imagine you're a group, you're, you're, you're a hippie. You're in a group of hippies decades ago and you want to start a school and you value education freedom, so you launch a school. It's Sudbury School, literally started by hippies from like the 60s. And it is what I call institutional unschooling. So you're probably familiar with the unschooling flavor of homeschooling. This is institutional unschooling. The kids literally run the show. They are in charge of the government. They hire and fire the adults. Uh, they can do whatever they want all day long. Like it's Lord of the Flies on steroids, right? Like it's <laughs> do this at your own risk. Um, they've been doing it for decades, and as we'll talk about in a moment, what comes out of this extreme education freedom example is nothing short of remarkable. You might be fearful, like most parents are, like, my kid would just play video games all day, you know, if they had total freedom. And we project, and we get FOMO, and we're worried. And yet kids who play video games all day end up becoming video game developers, making a quarter million dollars a year and having a blast, right? And so these kids, they'll, they'll play guitar all day long and then go launch a band and be successful, just like Erica Goldson was talking about, that the kids in her class were doodling and, and, and so forth. So I'm not advocating that you institutionally unschool your children, but we see, at least on the extremes, that education freedom produces some really amazing results. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention this now. I'm going to refer to a book later on by Peter Gray. And uh, he's a psychologist, and he has studied kids coming out of Sudbury School for years, longitudinal studies, right? So now these people are adults, they were students long ago. So are they happy? Are they successful? Are they fulfilled? Do they have meaning in their life? And comparing that by contrast to, let's say, public school peers. And what he has consistently found is that the kids coming out of this school rank above all of their peers. So education freedom is producing competent, economically successful, thriving, personally happily, happy people because their curiosity and their freedom was honored from a young age. You've probably done this like me. I, I break laws. They're, well, some laws, I should qualify. IRS might be listening. I don't break any IRS laws. Um, but uh, you've let your kid like drive on your lap in the car, you know, and you ever done that? I've, n I've never done that. But theoretically, if one, <laughs> if one were to do such a thing, um, you know, you have your kids sitting on the lap, on your lap, and, and they've got the steering wheel, and if you catch a sideways glance of their face, do they look upset? No, like massive grin, right? Because like, wow, I'm in control of this machine, and they love it. The problem that I see with a lot of our modern education system is that we are bus drivers in our kids' lives, and they are passengers. They're not driving their own bus. And, and I get it, right? We don't want to give them the keys and say, go nuts, right? But at least have them sit on our lap and hold the steering wheel and make some decisions and have a little bit of control with boundaries. And that's the benefit that education freedom can bring. Okay, the next problem was that uh, education is industrialized. The solution is that it be individualized, that we not conform to a system, but that any aspect of the system conform to us. I can't tell you how much I love DoorDash and these apps where like, I don't have to go to the restaurant and sit in the waiting room and then deal with people and talk to people because I'm an introvert even though I speak on stages all the time, which is really bizarre to me. Um, I love that I can tap a few buttons, get precisely what I want, when I want it, on my terms, right? And this is like something that we all enjoy is that when a system conforms to our desires, because we're all different. Some of you may be like rejecting half the things that I'm saying, and that's okay, I don't care, right? We're all different, it's awesome. But the problem is that we have an industrialized education system, including in many of our homeschools. Now, for the individualized aspect of this, if you've not seen any of the TED Talks by uh, Sir Ken Robinson, I highly recommend you go Google them. Ken Robinson TED Talk. 
He has some of the most viewed TED Talks. He passed away a few years ago. And here's a quote from one of his. He says, we have to go from what is essentially an industrial model of education, a manufacturing model, which is based on linearity. In other words, you know, one step after the other down a path. He says it's based on linearity and conformity and batching people. We have to move to a model that is based more on principles of agriculture. We have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process, it's an organic process. And you cannot predict the outcome of human development. All you can do like a farmer is create the conditions under which they will begin to flourish. When we moved to our home about a decade ago, we had a big space for a garden. I was super excited because we were in a little starter home where I tell my wife all the time, if, if you snap your fingers and the walls disappeared, you could like touch your neighbor. You're that closely squished in in all these homes. So we moved to this bigger one. We got this space and a garden. I'm so excited. And I underestimated what it would take to be a successful hobby gardener, right? <laughs> because the pests come and the, anyways, I'll, if you come to my speech in the morning uh, tomorrow at 10, we're gonna talk about some spicy stuff and I've got a story to share there too. But the, the issue here is that we can't predict the development of the plants. I can't predict what that plant will grow into, right? I don't know if this will turn into like a big plant or if it'll be stunted in its growth or if it will produce like several cycles of uh, fruit or vegetables or whatever, right? We just know that we have to provide certain resources and let nature take its course. Hopefully there's some divine inspiration along the way. Maybe I wasn't praying enough as a hobby gardener. I don't know, but I struggled. But what Sir Ken Robinson is talking about, I've always wanted to become a sir. I should look into how I do that. What, uh, what Sir Ken Robinson is talking about, I actually, years ago I bought for Christmas, uh, there's this thing, I, sorry, I, ADHD. I'm like, hey, story here, story there, let's bounce. So for Christmas I bought my family, so if any of you, anyone here has a heritage from Scotland at all? in your family, a few of you, you can go online and you can buy a one square inch plot of land in Scotland, which apparently allows you to call yourself Lord or Lady. So now everyone in my family, I'm like, you may address me as Lord Boyack, and uh, my kids aren't buying it yet. Um, okay, so back to Sir Ken Robinson. So what he's talking about is the need to move away from that conformity and that conveyor belt, but instead focus on not a mechanical process, but the principles of agriculture. If you've studied at all the history of the modern education system, and we'll talk about this in the morning as well, the people who architected it were very much trying to shape and fashion children after a mechanical process. When you get into John Dewey and John Goodland and Horace Mann and all these early architects of the modern school system, they were, shall we say, um, What's a charitable way to say this? They were crazy, but they were also, uh, uh, they, they were collectivists effectively. They thought that individual children should be subordinated to the collective. And these people wanted to shape society and they wanted to, like Horace Mann has this quote where he says, men are like cast iron, children are like wax. Otherwise, in other words, adults are very set in their ways. It's very hard to change any of your opinions, right? but kids are malleable. And that's why dictators throughout time immemorial have always gone after the kids. We'll talk about that spicy stuff tomorrow. Okay, moving on. Here's another quick story before we continue with our problems and solutions. Logan LaPlante, this is a kid who uh, coined the term hack schooling. So he says, I didn't used to like to write because my teachers made me write about butterflies and rainbows and I wanted to write about skiing. And then he gets pulled out of school, he becomes a homeschooler, he says, now I get to write through my experiences and my interests that sparked my love of writing. He loved uh, skiing. He worked, he got a little apprenticeship in like a local ski shop. He got a gig writing for a ski magazine uh, and he loved it, right? And where before he struggled with writing, now he was enthralled by it because it was all in service of a purpose and a passion that he had. Again, context before the content. Like, did you ever have English class and the teacher sits you down and says, okay, today we're reviewing the past participle subjunctive. It's like, who cares? Right, like I, I don't wanna learn that, right? I just wanna learn how to write well. Okay, I'll have a story on that a little bit later too, but let's continue. So problem and solution. Again, the problem is that we're authoritarian. It's that I must be the source and dispenser of knowledge and I will impart it to you. The solution is that we need to follow a Socratic method. We need to ask questions of our kids and draw information out of them. If you look at the root word of educate, it means to draw out of, right? Not to put into and fill people's brains with things. It's to draw out of them the unique insights and character and curiosities and passions that they, I believe, innately have. One example of a Socratic school is Acton Academy. Acton Academy is a network of privately owned micro schools across the country. 
After a decade of homeschooling, we actually enrolled our kids in an Acton Academy this past fall. It is the only schooling model I have ever seen that I would feel comfortable trusting my kids with. I'm not quite Lord of the Flies, Sudbury School there quite yet, right? Uh, so there's a little bit of structure here, a little bit of guidance, but a ton of educational freedom. And what they do really well at Acton Academies, by way of example, is the Socratic method. The teachers are not teachers, they're guides. They're there not to give you information, but to help you figure out how to find it on your own. And that's something I think we struggle with as parents because we're getting nagged and our kids are asking us so many things and it becomes easy to just give them what they need to like move them on their way so that you can go focus on what you wanted to do. Right, it's very tempting. But the challenge is that we're depriving them of opportunities to challenge themselves and grow. Okay, then we got age segmentation as the problem and so simply the solution here is age mixing. This is why I'm a big fan of homeschooling co-ops. I think one downside is that some of them start to segment very narrowly on age, especially as they grow. So the more activities and classes there are with multiple ages, you're gonna see some of the benefits from age mixing that John Taylor Gatto talked about. Okay, here's the book I mentioned earlier from the guy who studied all the hippie kids, <laughs> Peter Gray. This is in my top three books. This is a must read. It's called Free to Learn. The subtitle is Why Unleashing the Instinct to Play will make our children happier, more self-reliant, and better students for life. Okay, so here is what Peter Gray says. Children learn best on their own initiative through their own self-chosen and self-directed means. The best way to help children learn is to leave them alone, except when a child asks for help or advice. Again, very challenging for us. We feel that we need to like create mini-me's, right? Like, you need to learn all the things that I had to learn and make sure that you're not missing out. Which takes us to my story. So I'm on the bottom left. Yes, I grew up in San Diego in the 90s, so I have a puka shell necklace on. Please forgive me. <laughs> a few years ago, as an April Fool's type of thing, I took my next youngest brother, who's on the lower right, and I cropped his hair out in Photoshop, and then I put it on everybody else's head. <laughs> except I didn't have to do my mom's because it was so similar, and so we teased him a lot for that. So I grew up in California. My mom apologizes to this day for not homeschooling me because it wasn't a real thing in California in the 80s and 90s. Back then, it was like the weirdos over in the commune that were doing it. She just had no exposure and didn't know. And the challenge that I experienced as a student, frankly, I, I really strongly disliked school. Um, I enjoyed the social aspect like most kids would but I didn't like being forced to learn. I, didn't, I, I was the kid who would say, why do we need to learn this? And no one would ever give me context. They would never explain. It was always the just-in-case answer. You may need this in the future. And more often it was, well, it's on the test. It's in the standards. I'm required to teach it to you. And I was deprived of context. And I'm the kid that asks why. I want to know. And I'm very anti-authoritarian and very libertarian, so I'm like, don't tell me I have to learn this. Give me an actual answer, right? And they never did. So I struggled in school. There were three topics that I did the worst in. One was English, one was history, and the other was more in the high school, college age, economics. I couldn't stand economics, which is hilarious because those are the <laughs> subjects that I like, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, a little fate loves irony, right? A uh, little, little bizarre that now I'm teaching millions of kids out there about all the things that I struggled with. So my mom, we, I live in Utah now, and my mom was back home a few years ago I've written, actually, that mediocrity book I mentioned that's coming out in a couple weeks. is my 40th book. I know I have an addiction. It's okay. I'm in a program. And uh, when I had written about a dozen of, uh, of my books, my mom happened to be back home, and she bumped into my eighth grade English teacher. And so they're exchanging pleasantries and chatting, and then the teacher proceeds to ask about me. Hey, how's Connor doing? So when your eighth grade teacher remembers your name all these years later, it's either a really good thing or a really bad thing, right? I was not the most stellar student. So she tells her how I'm doing, and then she's like, oh yeah, and he's written a dozen books. And it was like, you know, like, how did Connor write books, right? And the problem, even though now we're teaching all these kids, doing, you know, assemblies and class presentations, and we got a cartoon now and all the rest, the issue is that I, until I graduated college, never had the education freedom, the time, the mental energy to focus on what I was curious about. Like in college, economics, it was all charts and graphs and supply demand curves and the intersectionality of what like, no, boring, right? Economics is really the study of human behavior and why people make the choices that they do. And you can teach economics not through charts and graphs, but through story. And you can understand so much of this stuff more easily, but no one ever taught it to me that way. 
And so my question as I became a dad was how do I help my kids avoid the same fate that I had? How do I make sure that they don't have to wait until they're in their mid-20s before they figure out what they're actually curious about, interested in, and figure out their path in life? How can I, with a seven-year-old, help them discover who they are, the path that God has out in place for them? How can I do that as a parent? And that led me to passion-driven education, which we'll talk about in a moment. For me, it all orients around this question. What do we actually want our kids to be learning? So ask yourself that. Is it reading? Is it writing? Is it arithmetic? Is it history? Is it economics? Like, what are the things that you want your kids to learn? These are my answers. And these are things that the modern school system miserably fails to produce in our kids. I want my kids to be curious. I want them to be motivated. I want them to be creative and innovative. There's a great quote from Stephen Covey, right? Begin with the end in mind, he would always talk about. If you've read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if not, it's a good book. Begin with the end in mind. What is the end that we desire for our children? For me, I want my kids to figure out their path in life two decades prior to their old man. I want to accelerate them on their journey that God has in place for them. How do I do that? If these are the traits that I want and the character that I want them to develop, how do I reverse engineer that and create an education process that supports this? Which leads me to my son, Keaton. This is Keaton at his birthday party. Now this was like, gosh, seven years ago. And I give this presentation several times a year and each time I'm like, should I update the photos and use more recent ones? I'm like, no, he's super cute. I love using the, the, the old photos. He, at the time uh, that I wrote this book, Passion Driven Education, he was a huge Angry Birds fan. And so I'm gonna use Angry Birds as an example to show you how passion driven education works, how it's a solution for so many of the problems that we've been talking about and how you can inspire your kids to love learning. The basic concept is this, you start with your child's passion. Yes, their passions will change over time. Yes, they'll change four times in a week. That's what kids do, we have to roll with it. But we start with their passion, and out of their passion, we hook into those all the various subject matters that we want them learning about. So in the case of my son, we're figuring out an Angry Birds spin on everything that I want him to learn. I take every subject and I figure out how to weave Angry Birds into it. And I cannot tell you the magic that happens when I even mouth the words, or years ago mouthed the words Angry Birds. Now it's Pokemon. Like if I say anything about Pokemon, like I've got his attention and he's willing to consume any information that I share, right? And so when we honor their passion, when we speak their language, so much of language, so much of learning is we're making kids learn a foreign language. It's like if you want to be good at algebra, you have to learn the language of mathematics, X and Y and these abstract ideas, right? If you want to learn uh, science, biology, you got to learn kind of the, si the, the language of biology. So we're making our kids learn. It's like we're, you know, put them in Bangladesh. Here's 20 bucks. Try and make it home on your, like they're not going to be able to, right? They're, they're, they don't know the language. We need to speak our children's language. We need to speak at a level that they understand. And that's where passion driven education really shines. For example, science. So if you know anything about the Angry Birds apps, you know that you, know, you fling a bird and then gravity you know, kicks in. And this one on the bottom right was Angry Birds Space. They have several games. So there's planetoids with that blue thing is like a gravity field. So once you go into it, you start getting sucked down towards the little planetoid. And so I was able to teach my, at the time, I think it was, gosh, seven. I was able to teach my seven-year-old physics. <laughs> Not by sitting him down with a physics textbook or a YouTube video, Physics 101 for seventh graders or anything like that, but by simply talking about how Angry Birds works, how gravity works, force, mass, acceleration, and all the rest. And he's learning these more advanced scientific concepts at a young age because he has context. The content makes sense and is interesting and he retains it and perhaps applies it later on because there's context, because I'm speaking to him in a language that he understands. Math, again, get rid of X, get rid of Y. What does that stuff even mean? I don't know what that means. I'm seven years old, right? Instead, I take the acronym of like the first letter of each Angry Bird. So this was Angry Bird Star Wars when I did this. So IPD, that's Imperial Probe Droid, right? And so I took, if you have 10 IPD plus three IPD minus IPD over six, what is that? And I'm just throwing these, like we're just sitting there on the afternoon, again, an informal moment. We've got like 15 minutes before we gotta go to wherever we were gonna go. I just grabbed a piece of paper and we start doing some little math formulas just using Angry Birds acronyms. And he loved it, he ate it up. 
doesn't realize that he's learning algebra because I'm not forcing him to speak the language of algebra. I'm simply speaking his language and he gobbles it up and we've done all kinds of math stuff. This was uh, teaching him spreadsheets and graphing. So we took all his Angry Birds toys and we mapped which color was which and how many he had. And so now he's learning how to use tools like that, again, with context for something that matters to him. Art, this one's easy for something like Angry Birds, right? This kid was like creating all kinds of Angry Birds drawings and cutouts and just having a blast. Uh, he would create these little uh, Valentine's notes and booklets, which leads us into writing. He would, if you take like an eight and a half by 11 and you like fold it twice, cut once, and you get like a little eight page booklet, booklet, right? And he would write and write and write, tiny little eight page Angry Birds stories. They were super simple, he's like seven, you know? And, uh, and he would carry around a little Ziploc bag gallon size full, crammed full of these little booklets. And if you came over to our house, you were walking away with an Angry Birds booklet, right? And he would just give these out generously. And he's writing and he's writing. The kid is now, turns 14 next month. He's working on 13 different books right now. He's got these Google Doc, like, I feel so bad because he's like, Dad, will you edit my book? And I'm like, which one? You've got 13 and they're so long. And, you know, he's, he's just pumping out. He's creating like fan, Pokemon fan fiction. He's creating his own universe. And I don't know if it's good. It may be awesome. I got to spend more time with it and, and, and lean into it. But like the kid is a writing machine. And it all started with Angry Birds. Just like for that Logan LaPlante kid, it started with skiing. I didn't sit him down and say, do an essay on the, you know, Constitutional Convention and you know the anti-federalists and the like no I don't force him to do something I want him to do I take his interest and I give him an assignment oriented around that and he loves it because he wants to spend more time with what he's curious about There's an example of one of his books Angry Birds read by Keaton um, Okay creativity uh, this right here is like uh, sorry he created an Angry Birds sorry game that he played with his sister He created a little Olympics thing So this is like the gold badges and so we had all these like obstacle courses and things like that And it was just Angry Birds themed and he's just being creative. There's so many more we talked about business development So who's the business behind it? How do businesses work? How do you start a business? What's an entrepreneur and he ate all this up? He loved every moment of it, just talking about random business principles. We talked about e-commerce and money. It's like these things aren't free. When dad taps that you know, $4.99 and downloads it, what is money? How does it work? What's a bank? What's inflation? All of a sudden he's learning all these things and it's giving him even more context for something that he's already curious about. Coding, it's like you're playing on an app. How does that work? Did you know it's all ones and zeros? Huh? Right? Okay, let's go learn about computers and how they work how to develop things. Let's learn how to code your own thing. Let's pull up a simple little JavaScript tutorial. And he's seven years old and we're playing with JavaScript, right? Because he wants to create a little game. Uh, manufacturing, you know, your plushy toys. Where do those come from? What's cotton? How do you harvest cotton? Where do the dyes come from, right? Like all of this kind of stuff, transportation, logistics, all that kind of stuff. It was all centered around what he was curious about. Okay, back to Peter Gray. He says, children come into the world exquisitely designed and strongly motivated to educate themselves. They don't need to be forced to learn. In fact, coercion undermines their natural desire to learn. What they do need is opportunity. My argument to society at large is that we need to stop thinking about educating children and start thinking about how to provide the conditions that maximize each child's ability to educate himself or herself. Again, can't recommend the book enough. He's a developmental psychologist. And this is so counter to the modern education system. This is so counter to the problems that we listed earlier with what's happening, not just in the public schools, but in many of our home schools as well. It's counter to the experience many of us have had as students and that bias and baggage that we're bringing to our own parenting and our own homeschooling. The idea that they are innately motivated to educate themselves, that force, that coercion, that like that seven-year-old at the beginning that was crying having to do this homework assignment, right? Kids like me, when I was young, I thought I hated learning because I hated school. I, I thought homework was drudgery. I hated it. Like Cliff Notes were my best friend, right? You know, like any shortcut I could find, I would take. I cheated. I cheated in school because I was told that the grade was what mattered. Like Erica Goldson, she chose to lean into it and become an obsessive, probably has OCD or something that she's like that fixated on things, right? But I chose the path of least resistance. I cheated because ultimately what mattered was the grade. And I was never given an opportunity to think about what mattered to me. 
like Paloma, unlike Paloma, I should say, I was never asked, what do you want to learn, right? I was always having to conform to someone else. And I think that is such an opportunity for us to, as parents to reframe how we educate, to see our children as innately curious, to honor their individuality and not make them conform to a system that someone else or even us have shaped. I don't want to impose upon my kids a, de a design that's my own because I believe they have their own path. They have their own journey. God has something else in mind for them than I can even fathom. I don't know what that is. So instead of me projecting onto them and forcing them to learn what I think they need to learn, I want to help them figure out who they are and what their path is and what we need to do to support them down that path. Back to Sir Ken Robinson. He says, look into the eyes of your children and rather than approaching them with a template about who they should be, try to understand who they really are. Not who they will be, future tense, who they are now, present tense. And yes, uh, you know, we'll have some time for q and I'll, I'll preemptively answer the question, what do you do when you have like 43 kids at home and how do you do this for everyone, right? <laughs> Okay, I get it, right? It's hard when you've got multiple children and they've all got passions and different interests and different abilities and they change week to week and it's hard to keep up with. This model tends to work best for, I would say, the middle school years. The elementary school should just be play and if you don't believe me, go read Free to Learn, right? Uh, can't recommend that book enough. I think all elementary school should just be play, reading, and bonding as a family. Middle school years is where passion-driven education really shines because kids are just starting to come into their own. They're starting to develop passions more seriously. It's hard to figure out what your five-year-old's really interested in, you know? And so in the middle school years, it's much easier. And they're trying to figure out who they are and you can help them in that path. And then high school, right? Then they got apprenticeships and opportunities and like Logan working in a ski shop and everything else. There's so much more adventure and opportunity in the older years. So really the sweet spot here is the middle school years where this really applies. All right, wrapping up. So we got some contrast here to, to note. If the bad is learning by subject, again, regimented, structured, 45 minutes, ring a bell, move on to the next thing, conveyor belt process. The good is learning by interest. Because, like, like think of the kid who struggles in math, being given all the math assignments and the math worksheets and the math curriculum, right? But then let's imagine that kid two years later, and there's all kinds of stories like this, where that kid sees, let's say, a SpaceX video, and they see one of Elon Musk's rockets taking off, and that kid suddenly develops a significant interest in rocket science and rockets, and starts binge watching YouTube videos and reading Wikipedia pages and checking out books at the library and going to conventions about, you know, rocket science for kids or whatever all of a sudden that kid is gonna learn more about math in the span of a few weeks than he would have in a few years because he's got context. When I figured out what my passion was, what my purpose in life was, which is freedom, trying to create a freer society, I knew that I needed to learn how to write well. I needed to understand economics and how humans operate. I needed to know our history so that we could talk about how to learn from history and improve our future. And so I went down rabbit holes like crazy but I loved them because I had a purpose. I had context, I had a passion. And all of that learning was not drudgery, it was not assignments and worksheets and multiple choice quizzes with bubble scantrons and number two pencils, right? It was 3 a.m. in the morning watching some random, you know, video about this obscure thing about American history that I never would have thought of before. And I remember it and I love it and I appreciate it because I have context. If the bad is knowledge given in an authoritarian manner by the parent or the teacher, the good is that the knowledge is acquired by the student, but just supervised by the parent or the guide. Again, we are not dispensers of all the knowledge. I can't tell you how reassuring it is, mostly for the moms, 98% out there, who realize that they don't need to be the teacher and knower of all the subjects. All they have to be is a good Googler. <laughs> Right? You're a resource provider. You're there to be a traffic controller and point your kids in the right direction to help them find resources, to ask them Socratically, well, where would one find materials like that? What do you think? And then facilitate it. Buy it, rent it, go to the library, whatever you need to do. Right? We don't need to be the knowers of all the things, and in fact, we shouldn't. Because if we train our children to learn from authority figures, I think that has some negative social side effects 
as they mature. Again, that's kind of a spicy political topic. Come tomorrow morning if you're interested in that. We have to be training our kids to develop critical thinking. We have to help them be independent, not dependent. And if everyone is kind of slavishly trained to learn from authority and trust authority, I think we go down some pretty dark paths as a society. Okay, if the bad is goals set by the teacher or parent or curriculum creator or whatever, the good is that the goals are set by the student. We know this. We know that when people are self-motivated, they are self-actualized. They will do far better and retain information far more. The question for us is, can we accommodate it? Are we willing to actually help our children identify and pursue their own goals rather than trying to push on them what they should be? If the bad is rigid curriculum and textbooks, the conveyor belt process, everything is structured, then the good is learning from books and parents and mentors, the internet, outdoors, experience, learning through life. Because again, the, the modern school experiment is this artificial environment. Sitting at a desk, working through curriculum and worksheets, that's not how you and I learn. It's a very inauthentic human process to cram just in case all of this information and make them jump through all these hoops, only to then as adults switch to a just-in-time learning model, learning from all bits and pieces and finding resources to support them in what they desire to know or need to know. What if instead we could give our children the same authentic learning process as kids that we ourselves enjoy as adults? Finally, bad thing is a specific time for learning, again, regimented, Restricted, controlled, the good is learning 24-7, 365, learning through life, the informal moments. Some of the best homeschooling happens when you're in the grocery store aisle, right? And your kid asks you why things cost so much, and you say, well, let me tell you how much that bag of chips cost when I was your age. And then they're like, yeah, okay. Old man yells at cloud, if you've seen that meme before. Um, my kids are, they've heard that too many times. Okay, so wrapping up. This ultimately is very simple. <laughs> Identify your child's passions and then offer educational resources and opportunities built around them. Conform to your child rather than making your child conform to someone else's standard. If you're curious about any of this, I wrote a book on it a few years ago, Passion Driven Education. How to use your child's interest to ignite a lifelong love of learning. You can grab the Kindle or the audio or the paperback up on Amazon. That concludes my presentation. We have time for a few minutes for Q&A. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.